why do you think this serious cinema evolved? And what do you think were the circumstances that led up to the requirement of such serious cinema? Well, you know, serious cinema or parallel cinema, whatever you call, it evolved in the 50s in Bengal. It began in Bengal. And uh, the result was uh, there are many things, say, post-independent passion for theatre, cinema altogether. Last remnants of Bengal Ranasa, still people were there. And many other factors which uh, helped to this serious cinema to evolve here in Bengal. Then it got sprayed in the 60s in South India and also in Bombay. Uh, I shouldn't call it a movement because, you know, it's a different thing. You know, it's an effort of few individuals. It was not a movement like Nouvelle Vague or Italian neorealistic movement. But it's a great effort of few individuals and we got very interesting cinema in 50s, 60s and 70s. Do you think it happened in Bengal by chance? It may have happened anywhere else or were there some factors which contributed to it starting off here perhaps in the 50s? In oh, well, you know, it's not by chance. There are many factors, as I explained to you. Uh, still, there were some remnants of Bengal Renasa, which was a very strong factor. Cultural movement led by Ipta was also a very strong factor. And many other elements like the creation in literature, the new creation in literature, hungry generation, you know, uh, a kind of an avant-garde uh, approach to literature, theatre, and finally in cinema. Do you also think perhaps that the state of commercial cinema, as it was then in the 50s, uh, led to some sort of a counter movement which, which may have... Oh, well, you know, in India, if you call it a commercial cinema or entertainment films, what is my feeling that for last 50 years, uh, it's extremely boring and repetitive. Uh, wh whether it was in Bengal or in Bombay or in Madras, the same things. So we, of course, produce the largest number of cinemas in the world. But in my opinion, 95% or even more are quite repetitive. The same thing is happening for last 50 years or so, even more. So this new cinema brought new ideas, new forms. And of course, Pothir Pachali was a, a great eye-opener to Indian filmmakers who were thriving, you know, were trying to do new films. But Rithik was trying, Mrinal was trying. But Pothir Pachali gave confidence to all young filmmakers to make a different kind of films in our country. So you think uh, Pothir Pachali was something which happened at a very nice time. It happened at a time when people were actually thinking of change. Yeah, and of course. And it catalyzed the changes that were to happen. Yeah. So could you perhaps sum up the decade that happened just before that, the perhaps frustration with what was going on in the for the earlier decade? Well, you know, I think many people uh, did try to make different kind of films in Bengal and also in Bombay. For instance, Bombay, Raj Kapoor, Jia Sarhadi before Raj Kapoor, Mehboob Khan, and then Gurudat in Bengal, Borua Shaib, Devoki Bosh, they tried to do something different. But Pothir Pachili was a revolution, almost. It's an in incredible film we had never experienced in our country. Uh, and I think perhaps Pothir Pachili brought Indian reality on screen. And before that, the films were made based on literature. Even, you know, still in Bengal, we call it Boi Dekhte Jabo will go to see a book. Still, we have that kind of uh, feeling about cinema. So what happened, there were many uh, literature-based films, but Pothir Pachali was different. It was a cinema based on a great literature. Right, there is actually uh, so much more to be asked you uh, now that you come to a point which is so uh, dramatic as this. I mean, one could have asked you, what would have happened if Pothir Pachali did not happen? Uh, well, you know, it's very difficult. But I, as I said, that the ground was prepared. So people were really burning with ideas. And we found it in stages, in, in, you know, you know, in the theatres, like Utpalda, Shomu Mitro, Vision Bhatcha. It's already there. So I'm sure that something would have happened. 
But Pothir Pachali, you know, it happens in history. It happens suddenly and then it changes the whole course of history. It's like that. And you can't find perhaps a single cause for that. That's right, that's there right. There are so many causes which happen. Absolutely. So uh, we'll now maybe skip two decades and uh, we will admit that there was a lot of uh, stuff which happened just after this catalytic uh, evolution. And uh, we had a movement which we liked. I know you don't like the word movement, but we had a stream of films which, which catered uh, to uh, one particular uh, uh, philosophy, let's say, one sort of uh, raison d'etre. But then we tend to think that the movement somewhere, the movement somewhere went wrong uh, after the promise of the early 70s, you know, in the mid 80s, etc. Mm -hmm. It is generally accepted that it lost steam. What do you think are the reasons which contribute? Oh, well, there are uh, various reasons for that. First of all, I think that we lost a great middle class audience after the coming of television in the last 10, 15 years. And this audience was the real audience for serious cinema. They are now confined in, the, in their own houses. They hardly go to the theatres. And condition of the theatres is also responsible because, you know, when you want to watch something seriously, you want to watch it in a good theatre. Good theatres were not available for serious films. And condition of theatres became bad, uh, especially in Bengal. It's extremely bad now. And people started, you know, uh, sort of not going to the theatre anymore. So let's see everything you can watch. You know, it's a typical middle class attitude of life that when it is so accessible in your house, you can watch television. There are many things, movies, there are soaps, there are advertisements, so many things all together. So I think middle class, we lost middle class audience. And then uh, there was no effort by Indian television to support cinema. For instance, you know, the same thing happened in Europe when television came. There was no audience for theatre. But serious cinema survived in Europe. How? The television companies they sponsored movies for theatre. It was kind of a co-sponsoring, which never happened in India. I think it's very important that television companies, they co-produce films, both for theatre and television. Because, you know, you cannot go back. You can, cannot turn the clock. You cannot say the television, uh, you stop television. It's not possible. Television has come, internet has so many things. So you have to balance with time, which never happened in our country. That was one, another reason. And then, of course, uh, what happened, uh, this is, uh, you know, a lot of young talents getting nipped in the bud. How? Because when they're coming out from the institute or many young filmmakers, they're not struggling enough to make a film. They're getting absorbed by television companies. I know many young talents. The moment you go out of the institute, you get a job in a television company. So no more struggle and passion to create a film, to make a film, serious film, which were there very much in the 50s, 60s, 70s and early 80s. So that is one another reason. Uh, so there was a sharp decline in the last 10 years and lack of interest uh, from audience because, you know, they think, you know, after all, it will come in television. But television and cinema is different. So they're not bothered to go to the theatres. Well, in Calcutta, in my personal experience, there's still audience. Whenever my film was released, I got a very good audience. There was no problem at all. Uh, but in general, people that are, are not going to the theatres to watch serious movies. But on the uh, one point which you said was the first reason, was extremely interesting because you spoke about the middle class which cinema lost. Now, if I may point out that the middle class in your argument has played two roles. One is the arbiter of good taste. Yeah. Because they have stopped going to good films and which is why good films... You lost his audience, audience, yeah. At the same time... The A large chunk of audience, also yeah. ...susceptible to a tremendous middle class mentality which means stay at home, watch what you get. And there is no go out and get what you want, you know. 
So how could one class into the arbitrary state? Also perhaps uh, be so very, um, um, uh, you know, uh, functionless, you know, they get what they take. At the, at, and at the same time, you say that they are the people who could also uh, arbitrate as to what they get. Absolutely. So, so how does this dichotomy work? I mean, this middle class is a very flexible and extremely dynamic uh, factor in your, uh, in your, in, in your estimation. Is it? Of course, you know, but it depends. And uh, it depends on the time and the right situation. It's very important for middle class to react. Even during any political movement, middle class generally give leadership. But they're the first club, you know, people, they go back. They can't really face the war. So it's a typical middle class reality and it's a dichotomy. At the same time, it's a great paradox that you need middle class intelligence for creation of new ideas, at the same time, they go back. It, it's a classic example of middle class mentality, especially uh, in post-war world, you know, in, in, the, in recent time. Which means it's a, it is all about non-committal vote buying that you depend yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. I mean, they can actually carry you ahead, but you cannot depend on their shoulders. That's right. So, so right. Uh, is the state, do you think, responsible for good cinema? Uh, of course. Uh, state tried and again, West Bengal was the leader because, you know, they produced Patrick Majali, government of West Bengal. And after that, in the last 20 years, government of West Bengal tried to produce a number of films. Then it got a gate spread in other areas. In South India, they started giving subsidy to serious cinema in Karnataka, in Andhra Pradesh, in Kerala and state support was vital for the growth of serious cinema and of course NFDC they also produced number of films I think uh, the biggest producer for serious cinema but the problem was the state government and NFDC never tried to create an exhibition network for serious cinema they had given loans to some theatre owners to build theatres but what they should have done, uh, a create a kind of a project for distribution in small theatres. You know, because you never expect that you know, this kind of films will go in a big theatres. So small theatres were the real solution, uh, which they never tried. So they produced films, but marketing was very poor. Uh, I think uh, another factor for the decline of serious cinema lies on the filmmakers. Because now the filmmakers have become little complacent. In the 50s or 60s, even in 70s, there was a tremendous initiative of the filmmakers to release their film. If I give example of Ray again, uh, if you notice when uh, one of his film was running in the theater, he was making another film. So you are tested by your audience all the time and you are helping to grow your audience and you are interacting with your audience. So what happened recently that now filmmakers, they are very happy with one Indian panorama or whatever, a national award or one film festival abroad, one screening in television, perhaps one week run in Nandan in Calcutta. They are very happy. They go for another project. So they are not tested by the audience. So which, you know, in a way, uh, it works uh, both ways. At the same, you know, what's happening, audience, they are not getting serious films in a row. At the same time, filmmakers, they don't know what they're doing. They're so happy with few critics praising them, few friends. You know, uh, this is, I think, one of the, another very strong reason for the decline. Because filmmakers uh, lost that initiative. You release your film. What happened in, the, in our childhood, we had seen so one Ray film is running, then uh, Mrinal's film is running, Tapun Sinha's film is running. So you find so many good films all together in the city, which you don't find nowadays. It's a pity, real pity. And that perhaps is the greatest uh, of all pities because uh, if a filmmaker gets alienated from Absolutely. the audience, that he actually wants to reach out to. And we Whatever, you know, you need at least your niche. You need audience. Without that, you cannot grow. Whether it's a very large audience or a small audience, but you need an audience. You, your film might fail, but 
sometimes it becomes a success. But it all depends on the interaction between the audience and the filmmakers. Yes, we the young ones have heard about the uh, the stories of Ray himself standing in front of the uh, absolutely hall and asking people if they like the film. Not or not. only the director. I tell you my own personal experience. When Par was released, you know, in 80s, my trolley boy, electricians, they were going to the theatres every day. There was a different kind of discipline and passion to see their own work. Nowadays, forget about directors, no technicians, they go, they go to see their own films in the theatre. The whole culture has completely changed. So, uh, there are many things, you know, I think people are so busy with mega serial or serial and whatever. They are not concentrating on their own creation. And this works backwards, actually. This Absolutely. works against the... Uh, right. Uh, do you think that the NFDC is the only way to ensure serious films? No, no, no. No, not at all. The NFDC uh, had given a great support to serious Indian cinema. But it cannot become the only organization to make films, serious films. You need state initiative. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, there is a limit of institutional finance. So, what we need very strongly is a consortium of filmmakers and a different kind of collaboration, as I s said earlier, between television and private companies, between television and consortium. And consortium can create their own movies and market it. That is very, very important. In a way, the, in South India, in the commercial industry, there is a consortium. They have managed very well with bankers. Bank gives money in South Indian film industry, which is unthinkable in uh, our part or in Bombay or in Delhi, whatever. Uh, so it's very important when the, you know, they, they uh, thought that uh, a kind of consortium for s commercial filmmakers is necessary. Uh, a, a consortium means the kind of a discipline that you make 10 films, in seven films you might lose but in three films, you cover money and distribute and just uh, compensate the losses of other filmmakers. So that kind of compensation, uh, kind of consortium is very, very important. This is a very important point. Do you think that the consortium has got to be legitimized in some way? I mean, are there papers to be drawn up? Is it to be done in black and white? Because, you know, as you said, 10 films and, uh, and the course, other. So, 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 so who chooses? Who, who um, sort of argues the point? And, you know, what is the sort of black and white figure that we can arrive at? It depends, you know. Uh, it can become a consortium between serious producers, film directors and distributors all together. Because, you know, another very important thing for any project, any film, a real producer. Because in our country, you don't find real producers. They're basically financiers or managers. But I have seen in United States on Europe, the producer means his own film, a tremendous passion for that cinema. Uh, my film must become very good, both technically, content-wise, and at the same time, he it's his own baby. That is very important, that you need a very solid producer who has passion for a particular work. Gautamda, we have the example of uh, the producer's own baby. This is the Hollywood of the 40s and 50s, where Absolutely. the producers were kings. And uh, the producers also arbitrated to the extent that uh, directors, I can go on, and, and even editors, you know, weren't allowed to sit in for the whole of the film. You know, they only do their own part. Yeah. And the man who puts in the money, he has saved for the whole film. Now, that did not actually lead to good cinema. It, it led to good cinema in a, in a sort of a way. You know, we have Hollywood hits and we have great uh, technical expertise. But is that, do you think, good film? Because that was also one way of... Well, you know, uh, Hollywood produced great films, of course, great movies. And I think you are you're mentioning about so-called personal cinema. Personal cinema, in a way, uh, I think each and every film is personal at the same time impersonal. So how you look at it, and you don't have to shout that I am making a personal cinema. It will come automatically very spontaneously your personal feelings which will reflect on your screen so it's a kind of an uh, attitude of a filmmaker the how you call it how you define your own films you don't have to shout 
for instance, Ray or Ghatak never said that we are making personal films. But many things uh, emerged from their movies, which were very, very personal, which, from, which came from personal experience. So who is the filmmaker? Is it the producer who gets involved with the film, or is it the author of the film, actually? Both. I think you need the collaboration of both the author and the producer. Because, you know, producer gives you strength give strength to the author. For instance, you take any writer. If a good publisher says, okay, you carry on, I'm with you. I give an example of a great publisher called Dilip Gupto, DK Gupto, of Signet Press. DK created a great revolution. DK lost money, one after another project. But he said that my books must look good, must produce good things, what's happening in Bengal. And he tried. And you know, whatever you find now, good publishers in Bengal, they are following the best things of DK. So you need a supporter who can support the author. So that actually almost takes care of our next question. But I will speak it nonetheless. It says that cinema being one of the most expensive art forms, can commercial returns be discounted, do you think? Because it takes a lot of money and so many people and so much of effort. Of course, a lot of money at the same time cinema can earn a lot of money. <laughs> because this is a, perhaps a, uh, a great uh, expression of this century, that cinema and the wonder of cinema, the magic of cinema, uh, earned a lot of money. Because, you know, cinema can be seen by hundreds and millions of people. And whatever you call, whether television or video and other thing, it came with cinema. The concept is cinema, basically. Now, uh, now the viewing has completely changed in television area or in other areas. Uh, but basically, it's a mass media. So you can earn a lot of money. But at the same time, one should do experiment on cinematic form and technology. Another thing I want to point out that in our country, I, I said it was not a movement. It was sporadic and uh, a few individuals uh, made very interesting films. And sometime it was trying to get the shape of a movement, whether it's in Bengal or in Karnataka or in Kerala or in Bombay. But one thing we are really lacking, there was no effort, no contribution of Indians in the evolution of cinema, except playback system uh, conceived almost simultaneously in the 30s by Nitin Bosch and Mukul Bosch, his sound recordist, almost at the same time with Hollywood. But never, they never had the patent, so Hollywood did it. But after that, we Indians, we have no contribution. Our contribution is zero in the field of technological evolution. You see, in the United States, they had tremendous contribution. In Europe, each and every individual country had contribution. Japan contributed into films. Evolution of the technique, form, but we have no contribution. So it's a lack of initiative uh, from filmmakers, producers, and from the industry that we have not created anything which is Indian. Stressing your point, actually, in a way, your friend, Nasir, in an interview to us, had accused the movement of degenerating into mediocrity. He said that filmmakers, you know, like himself and the others, expect him to improve his own role, whereas they don't improve themselves. Well, and uh, he doubts that this is the one reason that, make him, that made him give up art films. Oh, well, you know, it's Nasir's personal expression, absolutely, his own experience. Uh, which is absolutely came from his own bitter experience in some movies or with some directors. I have nothing to say about it. Absolutely every uh, individual has his own uh, feelings and expression. But one thing I endorse with Nasir that mediocrity emerged in serious cinema. How? That I have seen many films, they are hurrying up to enter into Indian panorama, or they're trying to complete the film by 31st December just to uh, catch the target date and full of out sync, bad quality. You know, uh, these are the bad parameters. You cannot say that you have a brilliant idea, but you make a very shabby film. No. Uh, there I endorse with him that 
uh, what happened you know it's a, another it's an irony that in order to create something different you create something very hurriedly just to enter into the film festival and personally i've seen many films has this kind of shortcomings which is which are very bad well you know the viewing is very subjective uh, sometimes uh, you feel a film extremely long and boring and uh, it depends on your own taste and understanding of cinema or your love for cinema for personally you know i find most of the commercial films commercial movies are extremely boring and repetitive say about five or eight songs which takes about 1 hour and a fight sequence which takes about half an hour another 15 minutes for a rape scene another 15 minutes for tear jerker and something like that it's so repetitive and boring so it depends on on the audience how how you look at it you have already uh, told us uh, what do you think was lack of technical finesse in films because if they rush to uh, conform to deadlines like advertising agencies yeah. then you won't have good films anyway so we'll go straight on to the next one one accusation also is that that in this cinema um there was a lot of involvement with activism and this is one question which is close to your uh, uh point of view perhaps uh, the way you think it almost becomes a pamphleteer's agenda like nareba uh, narebazi uh, cinema per se had very little to do with those films do you think or were they propaganda or were they films or what is the role of the two well, activism in cinema it also depends on your social system and uh, what's going on around uh, in indian cinema uh, we never found the activism or that kind of pamphleteering for a political cause uh, you know except few films because you know we never had the same experience like latin america in latin america new cinema had grown with revolution latin american revolution so whatever we had seen in uh, great latin american cinema they are very activist cinema you know they were uh, part of the revolutionary activities so it's a different situation altogether which never happened in india what did you talk about the star system which grew up with serious films in india it also has its own uh, hierarchy and its own star system so what is your well, reaction star system is a very stupid system you know a star system is there everywhere all over the world Uh, but in india the problem is uh, star system again is very underdeveloped like our underdevelopment in hollywood the stars they charge hell of a lot of money in billions now but they work in one particular project but in india in bombay or in madras or sometime in the poor industry of calcutta the actors they work in 10 films at the same time so what do you expect you don't expect professional work and i find uh, the acting quality in indian cinema is extremely weak because you know the stars they never concentrate they can't concentrate on one project no but what about the star system in art house films you know serious film uh, uh, in art house films well you know star system sometime directors they become stars which is also wrong because you know when directors become superstar which is also quite uh, dangerous for a proper unit to grow because you know then uh, you don't care for others you form a very stupid ego which is quite dangerous at the same time i think some kind of dictatorship is necessary you know in order to uh, run a unit but other such system like uh, commercial cinema does not exist because you know even some very big stars big actors sometimes they get tired with their uh, run of the mill movies so they try to act in some serious movies and for that you know they don't uh, charge money hardly they charge anything they give dates so no problem at all because you know whenever uh, i approach to some stars i had never i never faced a problem i got a complete date and they were very considerate to work in serious movies Right. Uh, it has also been accused that the new wave of Indian cinema got trapped in its own formula. It has also been considered a sure shot way of garnering national awards and a certain critical recognition, though it often completely eschewed audience response, as you had said. Uh, already, I said that because yes. you know it's a 
uh, lack of initiative to interact with the audience. Because you know, uh, and you tend to create a, another kind of formula. Because you know, even this is not uh, only in India, but all over the world. I have seen many films in Cannes or in Venice or in Berlin. They were created for the festivals. There is a sudden twist which goes very well in film festival circuit. It was done very intelligently. But in 50s or in 40s or in 60s, uh, when great masters made their movies like Bagman, Ray, Kurosawa, they never cared. They never cared for this particular twister for a festival. What they have created, that became a formula for the festival. <laughs> on the other contrary. Quite right, because basically nowadays there is a, a perception from the laity that yeah. anything which is slow and drab and with very long pants, that must be an art film. No, 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 <laughs> that's, that's a very stupid idea. You know, some uh, filmmakers indulging that kind of concept, but that's wrong and you cannot carry on for many years with that kind of ideas and cliché. The NFDC, to come to a very serious point, still seems to be financing the same old faces. There is no fresh blood from FTII or elsewhere. Where are the subsequent batches of the film institutes or when are they going to come, when are they going to emerge, when are they going to have new things to say and new people to say them? Well, NFDC should try, otherwise, you know, again, uh, they will fall in their own trap. Because what happens in a government organization that at, at one point, the democracy doesn't work. What happens that you have many committees, you have script committees, you have uh, finance committees, you have many other committees in the board. For instance, NFC, I, I, I think, has no board for the last five years, which is unbelievable. But I don't find it very uh, absurd situation because, you know, our whole country is quite absurd and surreal. And what's happening, you know, that's even under the INB ministry for the last five or six or ten years, nothing moved because one minister is coming and going, government is changing so fast, there is no policy decision by the bureaucrats, nobody is taking that kind of decision. So uh, that impact is also on NFDC. The NFDC can, is not uh, getting enlarged in a different areas. So that's a kind of a blockade within the organization. So they should come out from that.